Thank you for coming to this session. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not able to be there in person, um, but I would love to interact with you through this email address uh, or through uh, any other way that we can con converse about this important topic. Each day we hear of yet another study which documents more species that are consuming microplastics or a new habitat or site which is polluted by these small particles. It's unlikely that anyone at this conference is unaware of the issue of plastic pollution globally. As scientists, our Twitter feeds and news consumption are often focused such that we receive this type of news. What about the general public? More specifically, what about people of faith, and particularly those of the Christian faith living in Europe? Europe is considered to be secular, and yet a recent study by the Pew Research Center entitled Being a Christian in Western Europe found a surprising number of respondents who identified as Christian. 71% of the almost 25,000 adults Pew surveyed in 15 countries still identify as Christians, even if only 22% say they attend church at least once a month. Most were what would they called non-practicing Christians, which they defined as people who identify as Christians, but attend church services no more than a few times per week. There is thus a significant number of people in Western Europe for whom identity as Christian is of importance, and many for whom an integration of theological and scientific thinking about an issue such as microplastics might be of value for motivating towards action. Much recent work on conservation is focused on how we might think about socio-ecological systems, recognizing that people are a part of the ecology of a particular system. Yet much of how this has in practice been implemented is to economically value nature or to include economic or wider poverty alleviation into conservation strategies. So while this goes a long way towards remedying the situation where people are excluded from nature, it often does not take into account cultural and spiritual values. The Society for Conservation Biology has recently recognized this oversight and has taken steps to help practitioners to engage with local faith communities. This has occurred through the Religion and Conservation Biology Working Group and specifically the document, Guidelines for Interacting with Faith-Based Leaders and Communities. In light of this, I want to present a case study of a project based in Western Europe designed to engage particularly Christians with the issue of microplastic pollution. The details of the case study will be presented, including its development, scientific research and development of monitoring methodology, educational events, including week-long experiences, which integrate scientific and theological study, and then the promotion of a microplastics toolbox, which allows others to replicate the project. Finally, I will suggest some lessons learned and particularly engage with the Religion and Conservation Biology Working Group's guidelines for interacting with faith-based leaders and communities in order to show its value and suggest its use more widely. Our search began initially for a project that would help our organization, Arasha, to work across our country programs in the Mediterranean. Three young scientists accompanied me on a trip to investigate possible field sites, projects, and topics, particularly near our field study centers in France. Arasha globally has a number of field study centers where science and theology combined in order to protect specific habitats and species and engage local communities with conservation and education. We identified a number of projects, but microplastic pollution was thought to be the most valuable project, which could be undertaken in any location and was at that time in 2015 topical, yet not as widely understood as post Blue Planet 2. Amazingly, one month post-investigatory trip, we had two interns in place with funding and based on location in France. Both were postgraduates with bachelor's degrees in conservation-related fields, and each had different but significant research experience. Much of Arasha's marine conservation work globally has been accomplished through dedicated volunteers who have given significant who have responsibility and are recognized primarily through their contrib contributions to papers and presentations such as this one. The initial work began by investigating through the literature possible methodologies for monitoring microplastic pollution and field site selection. We decided to work to develop a methodology that could be completed with little financial and equipment resources, but which might conform as much as possible to developing European standards for microplastic monitoring. In this way, our data could contribute to wider data sets, but be completed by an NGO such as ours with limited financial resources. We settled on the area of the Camargue near the mouth of the Rhone River and also conveniently situated near a field study center based in Arles. This area was wide, has wide sweeping beaches which are protected within a nature reserve, but also very close to heavy industrial areas and the mouth of the Rhone River, which is known for its contribution to Mediterranean plastic pollution. The methodology developed was to lay 200 meter transects along the high tide strand line on sandy beaches of the Camargue area. 
along each transect, five randomly selected 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter quadrats were dug to a depth of five centimeters, and all sand sieved through both a five millimeter and one millimeter geological grade sieve in order to collect the fraction of sediment and attendant microplastics within that size range. Metal and other non-plastic equipment was used in order to avoid contamination. Seawater was first filtered through a 300 micron filter in order to avoid contamination from the ocean. The resultant material was taken back to our field study center and clean water made to a seawater salinity was used to float the microplastics. These were then collected and examined under a stereo microscope and classified into categories. While this micro methodology was useful for accurate characterization of microplastics to a level that could be published in peer review literature, other types of activities would be necessary for engaging the average person in citizen science-based activities. It should be said that, the, that even though the much more precise methodology just presented was less amenable to a non-scientist, those without scientific training were often involved in the research and the activity itself generated enough interest from beachgoers that we had to designate someone to be the educator for the day, answering the many questions so that others could continue to work unimpeded. The primary non-technical citizen science method we began to use was that developed by FIDRA for their great nurdle hunt. This involves searching for nurdles, plastic pellets used as the basis for all plastic products on the beach, recording length of time, location, number of participants, and number of nurdles found. This method is simple, and while searching for one type of microplastic, sensitizes the observer to the multitude of other types of microplastics and general plastic pollution on the beach. Alongside these scientific enterprises, we developed several theological resources to engage Christians with a value-based understanding of how Christian principles apply to the global plastic pollution problem. This involved taking particular passages of the Bible and developing a question-based format for engaging people in a thoughtful exercise of applying principles to a specific issue. Additionally, several prayers were written which address very specific problems of plastic pollution in the ocean and which could be used before, during, or after research and conservation activities. In order to test our methodology with our target group of European Christians, we gathered together a small group at our field study center for a week-long experience which we called a Microplastics Discovery Week. During this time, we utilized both the theological resources developed and the citizen science microplastic survey methodologies. In addition, ample time was programmed for discussion over meals and experiencing both the beauty of the Camargue beaches as well as the more industrial areas of Foster Mir where industry is concentrated. This experience included both the field and lab portions of the microplastics methodology. Additionally, we utilized this theological and scientific material in a resource booth and activities surrounding the Monocology event, a week in Monaco each year set aside to consider issues of ecology and the environment. We also partnered with the Anglican Church of Monaco to deliver resources to their congregation. The materials developed and experience and knowledge accumulated during the project were gathered into an online microplastics toolbox. Project scientists were moving on to other roles and we did not want to lose the hard won knowledge and experience. We also desired for other Russian national organizations to use the toolbox to develop their own projects. Currently our teams in Portugal, the USA and Kenya are using the more detailed microplastic sampling methodology. The project has spurred a further five country programs to engage in beach or river cleanups and to utilize the Nurdle Hunt citizen science approach for studying and educating on microplastics pollution. A number of Christian organizations outside of Russia have utilized the microplastics toolbox to engage their constituents on this issue. We learned quite a lot during the first phase of the project and subsequently in its expansion beyond France and Monaco. This was first in learning about microplastics themselves, which is a fast growing literature. Additionally, we learned how to develop a microplastics program that engages not only the mind, body, and heart, but the Christian spirituality that works itself out in identity and or practice. Maintaining a balance between scientific rigor and interesting engagement of non-scientists has taken much practice and refinement of resources. We suggest an iterative approach which favors testing new resources immediately, which may only be 90% finished, with a target audience rather than extensive development trying to get a completely polished, finished 100% project, only to find that it doesn't really engage the target audience. Education was an important part of the project and at times had to have, we had to have separate capacity so that the scientific portion could move forward unimpeded. 
The Society for Conservation Biology's Religion and Conservation Biology Working Group document, Guidelines for Interacting with Faith-Based Leaders and Communities, details several stages of engagement with faith communities. Our case study is illustrated several of these principles. In the pre-engagement planning, principle number one states that, among other points, that one should think carefully about how to explain your project in language and ways in which the faith leader and members of the community will understand. Working with a variety of Christian communities with differing levels of scientific knowledge, Arasha researchers ground at least part of our communications in biblical language in an effort to establish a bridge between science and faith. During our work on microplastics in the Mediterranean, we used social media to highlight our scientific research and asked why Christians should care. We settled on the language of loving God and neighbor as touchstones that relate actions to reduce my microplastic pollution. We were able to use this in our time of biblical reflection during our activities on our microplastics discovery week. Also in the pre-engagement planning stage, the document suggests one identifies a potential liaison person who is respected, trusted by the local faith community to assure a local connection and can speak the language used in the community. Our work in Monaco was conducted through Father Walter, vicar of the Anglican St. Paul's Church in Monaco. This provided an insider in the community to help with meeting the appropriate contacts and also gave permission to work with members of the congregation. This resulted in a speaking request for a Sunday morning service and also the benefit of a free couch to sleep on during the Monocology event. This also relates well with a principle in the launching and implementing the research practice project. Number five, accept with gratitude invitations to special events and other opportunities to build mutual trust. Finally, though many more resonances could be delineated, in the section on closing the project, the first principle states one should assure the faith community receives some kind of benefit from the research conducted. Our microplastics toolbox served as an important knowledge management and dissemination resource. The project completed, significant knowledge and resources were learned and des designed, but with no clear way to disseminate or capture. The toolbox served as a means to document and make available the resources which were created during the project. As noted, this made it relatively simple for others to utilize and start their own projects, both inside of and outside of Arasha. In conclusion, we believe that our approach of combining faith and science resources in the microplastics toolbox has provided a means to engage Christians initially within Europe, but now globally on the issue of microplastics pollution. Our approach resonates with much of the guidelines for interacting with faith-based leaders and communities and can serve as a model for others to develop local projects which can reduce plastic pollutions in the ocean. Thank you for your time and for your attention.